<laughs> Welcome back to it's a BYU shocker. People want to tune in and watch that, yes. right? Live from Studio B, joining us now to recap part of that Utah win right now before he's on after further review is national champion quarterback, dual threat analyst, superstar Blaine Fowler. Blaine, how was your weekend, man? That was really fun. Like, fr from top to bottom, like even the flyover, like, like from the time, well, before the flyover, when when they opened the gates, so we were in getting ready to go, um, and then the show started, our, our countdown to kickoff show started, and then they opened the gates and the students came in. And when I watched the students sprint into the stadium, run to the seats, and, and people laying down on the seats to save seats for their friends, I'm like, this is on. This is insane. Like, this is, like you could feel from that moment on, the electricity in the stadium just built. And, and when it was pouring rain, nobody even cared. They got louder. Nobody cared when it was pouring rain. It was, it was an amazing environment. I, I would say best environment I've seen in a stadium probably since Miami, which was a, was a wow. crazy, amazing electric night. It felt that way on Saturday night, which is really, really cool. 1.5 million viewers, by the way, just on linear television. That's that's remarkable. Yeah, for a late game. It don't, and, yeah. and you cannot tell me Big 12 didn't take notice of that, too, yeah. by the way. Yeah. <laughs> hey, when, when BYU, all of the press conferences that we were all involved in last week, it became very apparent that the Big 12 just said, yeah, this was a no-brainer. BYU was a no-brainer for all of yeah. for all of those reasons. That environment and ratings and national, yeah, and and it all showed up on Saturday sure. night. All right, let's go to the on the field. What were your takeaways from that game? A game in which BYU controlled from the start. It it kind of verified a lot of the things that we've been talking about and that I thought, and then it and it eliminated the one question mark I still had even though Kalani's been telling me all along it shouldn't be a question mark. And I, I knew BYU was going to be really physical up front on, on offense, and they showed that. And they've showed that two weeks in a row. This is an extension of last year. Dif different guys, but guys that played, they are physically dominating this game. I had felt like over the last five years, Kalani and his staff have, have built the talent to be able to match up with Utah's physicalness, um, to be able to go just out physical people week after week, because that's what BYU – historically can do, right? Great tight ends, big physical linemen, dominating front seven on defense. And now they've added really skilled players at corner and in the secondary that can play man defense, and they've got depth there. A crazy cast of wide receivers and depth at running back to go along with what they're traditionally good at. The one question mark I had coming into fall was, are they deep enough and physical enough on the D-line? You know, how, how are they there? And Kalani kept telling me, dude, we're really good there. Like, we're really physical. Nice as a beast. Um, we can hang with anybody up front. That's not a concern for me. Like, he's told me this over and over, right? And we saw him against Arizona, and I thought, man, D-line was really good, that front seven. We knew the backers were elite, and we don't use that word unless they really are. But you got two, maybe three NFL guys in that linebacking core, and we, we, you know, we see Peyton Willigar, who's one of those he guys. He was a beast. Big-time NFL player, Peyton, or, or uh, uh, Peely is going to be a big-time NFL guy. These are legit big-time backers, but the question for me has always been, are they deep enough up front to hold their own? Utah is a big physical team, and BYU's front literally physically beat them in that game. And so I went, okay, I'm going to quit question. Kalani's not just – he's not doing this to us, right? He's not blue-goggling us. They really are good up front. And that was the only question I had on this football team. And so now I'm going, wow, if they're that good up front to hold up against that football team, th this, this team has a chance to do something special. Okay. How have your expectations shifted in terms of a win-loss record since BYU started the season 2-0 with wins over two Power 5 teams? Yeah, I, you know, early on I said, to me, the over-under should be eight. Like, I think they should get to eight when I go through that schedule before the season even started. Sure, you're talking regular season only. Yeah. Throwing a bowl game, nine right, wins. Right, And then, and, and so, and then I said, but, you know, they have a chance to win nine. Um, now I'm going, now I think the over-under might shift to nine, and I think they have a chance to win ten. And, and the only reason I say that, because there's nobody on that schedule that I look at right now, especially the, what, what's just happened with USC. And right. Right basic implosion and two weeks into the season they just imploded are you kidding me with that and I would actually rather have that happen now than late in the season because the, the worst thing for BYU and when we, we look at that schedule at the end of the year is for USC to make a coaching change the week before 
you know, at the end of the year and then have the players play out of their minds and inspired for the new coach and have energy and all that. I'd rather have it happen now so BYU can scout them by the end of the year and, and understand what they're doing. But when I look at that schedule, there's, there's nobody on there where I just go, hey, BYU can't match up with that team. I just know how hard it is to win football games, right? And so there's a number of teams on that schedule, as we know, that are really, really good. And so I would say my expectation has been now my over-under is nine, and I'm, I'm not going to be surprised by ten. Ooh. And, and if they win this weekend against Arizona State, Ranked opponent coming into Cougar Stadium, which which I like the matchup. Then I'm going, okay, now let's really start thinking about special seasons, right? Because that, that would be a, a 3-0 start I don't think anybody expected. Listen, and we pointed it out earlier. BYU has not started back-to-back seasons 3-0 since 1951 and 1952. Yeah. It never happened in the Lavelle era. They're on the verge of that if they beat Arizona State. Right. I mean, I think back to the, the – I think the best back-to-back years – are 83, 84, right? So, but remember, they lost. We can I say we? Yeah, you were you're on the team. On the team. If I'm on you team, I can say we. Right? On the team. So, so we lost. We lost in our opener to Baylor, um, and and we were ahead at the end of that game, and they threw a 50 something yard bomb on the last play of the game, and we lost. And then we had a little bit of resolve after that, and we went on. We didn't lose again that year, mm-hmm. or the next year, uh-huh. or the beginning of the next year, uh-huh. right? And so it we got to the point where we never thought we were going to lose again. Like, we just walked onto the field expecting to win. And that's a very special feeling um, when you kind of get on a roll and you have confidence, you get a little bit of swagger to you. You start to make plays. You play faster. And, and I feel like last season, even though BYU wasn't playing a slew of P5s, that they made a fundamental change in the way they think. They, made, they go out and they expect to, to stand toe-to-toe with anybody, and they expect to win. And so even when it started pouring rain and Utah made a little run, BYU mentally and the way you saw them carry themselves on the field, it was just like, no, we win these games. We don't lose. We're, we're going to win. They expected to win. I could see that manifest itself out on the field. That's, that's to be a special team, you've got to have that mentality. That, and even when you do lose, when you lose to Coastal Carolina, you go, oh, that was an aberration. We did stupid stuff. We should have won that game. We're better than that team. So when you do lose, you have to think that that's a, a fluke. I, I feel like they're to that point now. And they're physically good enough to match that mental, you know, uh, that mental positivity. And so, hey, the sky's the limit for this team. Now, this is the kind of schedule that if you go win nine or ten games, that's pretty special with this schedule. So Arizona State's done exactly what you would expect them to do. They beat two teams. They should have beat, put up good numbers. Offensively, predominantly, at least through the first two games, have been a running team. What do you make of the matchup on Saturday? It's it's an interesting. It's a little different than Utah. They're they're not quite as physical as Utah. Who is right? Um, but they've probably got a little more overall team quickness than than Utah does. Are you worried about that? The, the, I'm not really. The quarterback style is dramatically different. Right. So, so I think Charlie Brewer's really comfortable standing in the pocket and finding guys. And when Charlie's running around, he's really just buying time. He's not trying to run the ball, even though he can. He's just trying to buy some time and find somebody to get the ball to downfield. Uh, Jaden Daniels is, he's more comfortable outside the pocket. In my more mind. like Jaron Hall. When, when you keep him in there and he's got to throw over the defensive and offensive lines and you don't leave him a bunch of throwing lanes and you keep it congested, he, he's more average. He's, he's a very skilled guy. When I say average, it brings him more down to the level of other guys when you keep him doing that. When you let him break containment and he gets outside, he becomes really special. Um, and he's got a lot of quickness out there, so he can hurt you running the ball, which we've seen him do in the first couple. And he's got a mindset that he wants to run the ball, right? He wants to contribute. They they have play you know calls that involve him in the run game as a quarterback, so run run calls. And so it's a very different challenge for BYU, um, they're good. they can play a lot of man. You'll see them play some man. Um, Arizona State's not like they were a few years ago. It's, it's Boise State's offensive coordinator from right. just a couple years ago. So they run a lot more 11, 12 personnel. When we say that, for those that – that's one back and one tight end, one back, two tight ends. They don't run a bunch of 10, which is a single back and four wide receivers like they used to run where they're kind of throwing that air raid. They're a very balanced football team that really wants to run the ball first, which doesn't surprise me. Herm Edwards is an NFL guy, right? So for BYU, they have to stop the run, keep White, Rashad White contained, 
which I think they're very capable of. That front seven is very physical. Yeah. And then they need to keep um, uh, they need to keep Daniels in the pocket. Okay. Make him throw from in the pocket. Make him dump off, rally to the football, and, and that's the game plan. And if they can do that, I believe BYU's offense can run the football and do what they want to offensively. It's it's defensively, can they contain the big playability of Daniels? And to do that, you keep them right in there. Fair. I love the game breakdown. You can see more of Blaine on after further review tonight. Always elite, my friend. Thanks so much. Thank you.